What's up? Connie's Connie school. school. Hey guys. Hey, thanks for watching our film. Yeah. We are, man, I wish we could be, we wish you could be there. Um, unfortunately, just timing didn't quite work out. So yeah. we decided to uh, shoot these. Uh, we had you guys submit some questions. We're gonna and we're going to answer them. So we got a quite a quite a bit to kind of go through. So we're going to yeah. go into the first question, which is first one is what, what happened, happened right after the making of the film and what is happening in both of your lives now. Two parts there. Uh, right. Yeah. Do you want you want you want to start? Let me start. Go ahead and start off. All right. I'll start. So uh, for me, for Patrick, um, gosh, uh, what happened right after the making of this film was uh, we kind of went back to our everyday lives and in our jobs, just trying to pay the bills, work hard and, and do our thing. But um, for me in particular, I actually wound up leaving my job. I came back to a very stressful environment at a hospital that I worked at. And I, uh, I we came back, um, I guess with June 12th, we landed, or July 12th. And then yeah. I went back to, it was Justin's birthday. I went back to work on July 14th, my birthday. His birthday. Oh. And then, uh, Happy birthday, back yeah, to work. <laughs> right, yeah. And then October, uh, the same year, I put my notice in. I, I gave my, my boss a four-month notice to find someone to replace me. I left the job in January, and we've been this traveling, we speaking, meeting people all over the, the, the country, the, the world, really, uh, writing books and having a good time doing it. So that's what's happened on my end. How about for you, Jay? I mean, pretty much the same thing. I mean, I, I was working from home or at home, so I just came back home and kind of got back into the reality of that. Um, missed our families a lot. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, when Patrick left his job, um, he took a venture of faith, and we both kind of jumped in neck deep. Neck and, deep and kind of blind. <laughs> <laughs> kind of blind. And, but it's been an amazing uh, transformation for us. I mean, yeah. it, this pilgrimage completely changed our lives, for sure. So... Um, being able to speak and share our story and, and be able to keep developing things like, um, like our children's book that came out last year. We have some online stuff that we are working on. We're working on another book. So we got some awesome things yeah, fun that, stuff. that we're keep working on. So that's how we answer that. Yeah. All right. So question, question number two. Dos. What was your toughest moment and what was your most joyous moment? That's a loaded question. That is a very loaded question. Yeah. You want to start that one? Um, I would say, can I say the joyous? Because that's, I just go with my gut. Here. Yeah, go for it. The well, well do, answer them both for you. Answer them both. Yeah. Uh, the toughest moment, well, I don't know if it was a moment in particular, but just toughest in general, mm -hmm. was just being away from my wife and my kids. Yeah. Um, you know, we both love our, we're both family men. We love our wives and our children. Um, and... We, to be away from them, at least for me, was very, very, very uh, challenging. I hadn't been, or I hadn't been away from my spouse and my kids that long before. This is like a month and plus. So that was really hard for me just to be away from them because I love being around them. And that's, they're my life and that's what I love doing. Uh, the most joyous moment, which is kind of like, I guess, the end, the flip side of this was seeing my wife again. Mm -hmm. That was probably the happiest moment I've, I've probably experienced uh, on this pilgrimage. I mean, seeing her face again and being reunited with her was amazing. Yeah. How about you? Uh, I'll, I'll kind of echo you. I mean, being apart from my family was definitely hard. Um, toughest moment in particular, I, I can point to a very specific uh, uh, day where I would say the hardest moment psychologically, emotionally, mentally. And we, we had a lot of hard stuff. The, the Pyrenees was by far the most difficult thing physically. Yeah. But uh, when I kind of came to terms, and you saw it in the film, Truth to Pharaoh, but uh, when I came to terms with the fact that I had been failing my family in a lot of ways, I don't get into a lot of detail in the film, more so in the book, but um, my job had consumed me completely. And the couple days prior to Truth to Pharaoh was when I kind of came to terms with how much I had been failing my family. Um, I was so focused on being a provider that I hadn't provided the things they actually needed, which was time with me, love, and just being together. Um, I was more focused on paying the bills and a big salary. And anytime you come to terms with who you are and it doesn't line up with who you want to be, you face your demons and it's hard. But for me, as we're going through the Maseta, which is the, the desert stretch, I came to terms with all my demons at once. And that is not a fun place to be. It was, uh, I, I witnessed every single moment that I had failed my family at once. And I broke down and I wept. Uh, it was a very hard, very hard uh, day, but um, 
you know, you, you, you work through it, and my, my, my family still loves me. It's uh, and it was, still you. It, you do still love me. Yeah. <laughs> that was a that was a tough day. That was a hard day, uh, but I wouldn't trade it for anything because it led to some great conversations with my kids and my wife, and I'm a different person because of it. Now, as far as the most joyous moment, yeah, seeing our wives, I mean, it's pretty. Awesome. We're trucking in, and you, you, you can't hear it um, on on the film. But all I'm saying, like I, I, I didn't notice this until the, like the rough cut of the film. All I'm saying is, where are our wives? Where are our wives? Where are our wives? Over and over and over, because there's all the people. Like I can't see them. Right. And finally, we see them, and it's just like, oh, it was pretty awesome. We're home. We're home. Even though we're not back in the states at that point, we're home. We're with our wives again. So there you go. All right. All right. Question number three: uh, What is something that you learned about one another that you didn't know before you took this journey? <laughs> We've been asked this question before, <laughs> <laughs> and it's really embarrassing for both of us. Um, it is. Yeah. I'll, I'll go first in this one. Okay. I learned that Justin can make a ditty out of anything, anything. <laughs> every single morning he sang to me when I was getting ready. Every single morning without fail. With his shoes, his socks, whatever. I'm putting something on. And it was always the same thing. There's Pat. <laughs> Putting on my socks. He's putting on my socks. He's putting on my socks. Same tune, just different lyrics every day. Hey, I didn't say I was a wordsmith. Didn't just... know. Didn't know you would do that. How yeah. Um, yeah, we have been asked this question before. Um, I feel the bus coming at me right now. The bus now. is about to hit, hit Patrick right on the side of the head. You know, um, I've known Pat for a very, very long time. And I did not know he had the obsession with the number four. Like, a little OCD. A little OCD. So, like... Like, I don't know, checking things or making sure the door is closed or... Count my steps. Cap, counting your steps. Yeah, you know. Got to end on steps. Got to end a multiple of four. Got a little OCD with the number four. Brushing my teeth four times on every side. Every tooth's got to get brushed four times. I, <laughs> don't ask me how I know that, but I do. And I count. And it's crazy. Yeah. It, sure it, it was pretty funny. I remember us talking about that. I was like, what's the matter with you? <laughs> It was quite fun. Yeah, anyway, yeah. There you go. Yeah. All right. So kind of a small bus that hit you in the head. Yeah, yeah it was. It was too bad. It's just okay. a little embarrassing to acknowledge that. Yeah, I'm really weird. I got some neuroses. But you know what? We all. Question is a question for Justin. Ooh. So Justin was a graphic designer, and we were wondering. This comes from one of the students. If he still comes up with his artistic ideas, and if he has ways to express those ideas without the use of his upper arms. The short answer is absolutely yes. All the friggin' time. All the time. <laughs> no, it's a, good, uh, it's, a, it's a good thing. It is, yes. <laughs> you know, um, though uh, I can't design professionally anymore, uh, which is something I really, really love, and it's a big part of who I am as an individual. I always love design and art and all of that. Um, but I am creative every single day of my life, so I try to be. Mm -hmm. And that comes out in various ways, in different ways. Um, more specifically, when um, Patrick wrote our children's book, and he had the request for me to do the illustrations. And I'm like, okay, I can't use my hands. How are we going to make this work? And I'll give you a really quick background on that. Yeah. When I was in college, I did a series of pen and ink and watercolor. And um, I ended up giving Patrick, I think, like, Three or four of those? Uh, well, one, one was your gift to Don at our wedding. Yeah. And he gave me three more. Yeah. Later. yeah so, so four total. I, I didn't do very many of them. And I gave Patrick a few of them that were framed. And he's had these for all these years. And so anyway, skip ahead to writing this book. He said, hey, I want you to be able to, to illustrate this book. Um, but, you know, I want it in that style that you did it in. It's a non-negotiable. And I'm like, hmm, how are we going to get this done? <laughs> and so uh, for those of you who don't know, I use you know, I use a computer to do all my artwork and everything. And I use a voice. I use my voice through a dictation platform called Dragon, and uh, which helps me control my computer and do everything. I most, most things with it. And then I do, um, I do the rest with um, like the design kind of creative um, products that you have available with uh, like Adobe. Adobe has a Illustrator and Photoshop and um, and I use mathematics. So I use kind of XY coordinates to place stuff um, on the on the canvas and do whatever I need to do. Um, I couldn't do the line art for the illustrations because there's just absolutely no way. So we had to find somebody who could mimic my style. So after much searching, we did. 
found somebody to and this kid named Matt who's awesome helped me helped kind of um, do the the line art for me mm -hmm. but I did all the watercolor in our children's book with my voice pen and tablet and mathematics mm -hmm. and a lot of patience mm -hmm. so you know I we've learned this kind of mantra that there is one of our mantras is there's always a way always a way there is there's you know it may not be apparent uh, but you gotta you gotta think creatively and you gotta kind of work things differently. You gotta trial and error. And it may not be easy either. And it's not easy. Yeah, it may not be easy yeah. either. But usually when they're they're hard routes, if there's a way but it's more difficult, it's cool stuff on the other side. Right. <laughs> but by Patrick asking me to do the illustrations, I was able to co illustrate the book with Matt, I learned how to do something I I had never really done before. Mm -hmm. You know, he pushed me to be able to come up with a artistic style that I used to be able to do and and really kind of figure out how to do that. And much trial and error, we got to figure it out. Yeah, we figured it out. Some of you might be asking, okay, so what's the book? It's titled The Push. So if you're curious about that, go check it out. It's a, just a, a story about basically Justin and I's relationship now, but applying it to a couple of 10, 11 year old boys, who, one who's in a wheelchair and one who's not, and how they navigate just yeah. the day to day. And really it points to the fact that at the end of the day, no matter what uh, life has dealt us, we have a lot to offer. And so we wanted to get that message out to the kids um, that maybe in the, our, our book, I'll Push You, might just be a little too, um, too high of a level for them to understand. Get something in the kids that are out there to, to be able to appreciate everything they have to offer. So I'm so glad that Justin was able to make that come to yeah. life. Yeah, and we're so. both very, very proud of the end result. It's, so it's awesome. It's, it's yes. having... The, the camera crew there, how yes. did this change their journey, our journey? Yeah. Uh, honestly, it didn't change it that much. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't think it did. We don't know because we haven't done with camera without. But when you have a camera in your face or around you all the time, it's remarkable how quick you forget it's there. Yeah. It's also sometimes unfortunate that you forget it's there because maybe you say things that you... Probably shouldn't say on camera. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, oh. no me. It was all me. Both of us. <laughs> thank, Mostly me. <laughs> thank, thank the Lord. Oh, man. The editing process you know, made, yeah. it, made it easier on us. But that's life, though. I mean, what yeah. we went through was incredibly Very hard, very hard. So. But yeah, once you get used to it, you kind of just forget that they're, that, that they're there. I can't talk yeah. today. And they were really great. Uh, yeah. I would say the only funny kind of funny story with that was the very first day. I mean, right yes. out of the gates... We're going up the Pyrenees, and uh, one of our camera guys, or uh, his name's Robin, he's a PA or production assistant. You know, he he was watching us really struggle, and he just like, you know, as couldn't human age, he couldn't <laughs> handle it. He dropped his stuff and started pitching in to help, and we're like, we had to stop and say, nope. dude, you, you can't, you got to be a fly yeah, on the fly wall on to the wall. to just film it. Um, no matter how much we struggle, you gotta you gotta watch us. And I said, with the only caveat is if you see me rolling off the edge of a cliff or about to or something like imminent death, then, then you can intervene. <laughs> you cannot just film yeah. me dying. That would not be good. <laughs> be a very yeah. short film. Be short film. Be. Yeah. I'll drop you. But they were great. They were awesome. We love those guys. Um, we had, just so you guys are, are aware, we had two videographers, mm -hmm. Mike and Jasper, uh, Robin, our production assistant, and Terry, our director. Yep. Was with us. So awesome. Very, very skeleton crew. All right. All right. Next question. Okay. What What was your favorite part of the journey? Hmm. That's hard to have a favorite. There's not one singular thing. I I would say highlights for me was communal meals so with so many people from all around the globe and having trying to navigate conversations and different languages and but yet everyone was so happy to be there and just willingness to just figure it out and you just do what you do and you just break bread with one another and I really loved those those moments and being reunited with you would see somebody maybe a couple days you know off and on for you know uh, in a day or two or whatever and then they'd skip ahead for you know they might skip ahead or fall behind and then you see him again, it's just like, hey, it's like a family. Yep. So yep. I love it. Yeah. I would say for me, it's kind of the same vein. It was just witnessing humanity at its finest. You know, it, we, we hear all the garbage and junk that's out there all the time in the news. But on the Camino, when you're coming together, you all have this common goal, a common destination. But you have a host of, of, of 
lives that you lived. You know, everyone's from a different background, has a different story and different baggage and hard stuff. But there, everyone is coming together to just see how they can be a better individual and help others. That's, that's, yeah. that's like, like everyone is in that space. It's an awesome thing to be a part of. And that's cool. That's really yeah. cool to see that. Yeah. yeah. And to, especially be on the receiving end. So many times we were the receivers of that that help. That was very humbling. Yes. Yeah. All right. So I'll ask the next question, but it's for Patrick. <laughs> How much preparation did you have to do? I guess I'd be preparing both of us, but it's yeah. more for Patrick than me in this case. And that's why I'm asking. Yeah, question. sure, sure. So, uh, <laughs> a lot. So go ahead. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we made the decision to take the journey together in, well, in I mean, really in 2012. But uh, mm -hmm. when we actually pulled the trigger on a date, like we were going to go, uh, we were about a year out. So that would have been spring of 2013. So as soon as we made the decision, I w was pretty active at that point in time, pretty healthy, pretty fit, but nowhere near where I needed to be for this whole thing. And so um, I worked out six days a week, twice a day, six days a week. So Monday through Saturday for nine months straight, like did not miss a mm -hmm. single day. Even when I was sick, which probably wasn't the smartest thing in hindsight, but it was like I, I was just, I was so motivated. I had to be in the best shape I could possibly be in for this whole thing. And so every morning I was either on my bike in the garage or out riding, or I was in the gym doing a lot of metabolic type stuff, a lot of um, uh, body weight exercises, high reps, just trying to get my body endurance as high as it could be. And then I would do it again after work at night. Um, so put the kids to bed, kiss my wife, go to the garage, or go to the gym for an hour and a half. Yeah, so right. uh, constantly, and then once the uh, justice wheelchair arrived, about three months out from us leaving, I abandoned all work in the gym, and, and we, we just, spent hours just, and yeah. hours and miles and miles. I, I don't know yeah. how many hundred of miles we we did before the Camino. Yeah, totally. I mean we had to learn a lot about mm -hmm. being in that wheelchair because you know you think it's just like hey, you're just pushing a wheelchair down the road, but in reality it's a three wheeled device. So. Anytime the trail or a road that were, you know, it undulates left or right or whatever, the chair just wants to whoop, right, go right down it. So we had to learn how to navigate together. Uh, and so when we're, when I'm in my off-road chair, we are, and whoever's pushing me, it's a, it, we're, it's a one yep. unit thing. So, um, and then I became the navigator and Patrick was, you know, obviously the pusher mm -hmm. um, and many other people stepped in to help too, but. A lot of preparation. Pat did yeah. an amazing amount of work to get ready. And there's really no, even all oh, of that I'm didn't ready. quite prepare you. No, no. So. But to kind of add on to what Justin's saying there, in the film you, you saw all that mud we were going through. At times, either I'm in back or Ted's in back and then the other person's out front. But we are pulling so hard or pushing so hard that we're, I mean, our upper bodies are almost at a, you know, parallel to the ground, we can't see anything. So when Justin says navigator, that's what he means. He is he is scoping out the landscape constantly to avoid rocks, deeper patches of mud, um, divots, whatever it might be. And then we're just listening to him as he shouts out right, left, you know, yeah, big dip was... coming up, whatever it is. And so we're prepared. And that way we can just be that much more in tune with what yeah. the chair needs to make it as, as, uh, um, as easy on Justin, but also as easy on, on, on us as it can be because we had to reserve our strength. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of preparation. A lot of preparation. And that's not even including the film. <laughs> right. So yeah. there was a lot of stuff that went into that. We could talk for a very long time on Good. that, but we won't. Uh, All right. We won't bore you with that. Next question. How was the air quality and did the altitude have an effect on Justin? And then did either of you have to get medical clearance to go on the trip? Uh, so answer that question. The air quality, I mean, it didn't bother me at all. I mean, we weren't like crazy, crazy high altitude. It was I mean, clear. It was clean air. the high, yeah, clean air. So the highest we were at, what, 5,200 yeah. feet, um, was the second mountain range that we went over. Mm -hmm. The Pyrenees is, is about 41 or 4,200. Um, you're starting at sea level. It's quite a climb, but it's not as high to affect that. So for me, it didn't affect anything. Yeah. No, no, no that was, that, that was, that wasn't a big deal either one of us did either of you have to get medical clearance to go on the trip i uh i've had three knee surgeries prior to spain and my, my orthopedic surgeon who did my last surgery was like you're, you're gonna do what <laughs> i'm like yeah i'm going on this trip and push my buddy in a wheelchair 500 miles he's like no you're not I'm like motivation you tell me i can't do something i'm gonna do it <laughs> so i didn't have medical clearance i think i actually had a you know physician discourage me for doing this <laughs> but 
Turns okay. out that and it was had, okay. And believe it or not, we actually had many people say we were stupid people. and we shouldn't do it. So yeah. yep. it's just kind of proof, at least for me, that sometimes you don't need to listen to the negativity in listen, life. Listen to your hearts. Listen to your heart. Yeah. Where's your heart telling you? Go from there. No, I, and I didn't have to either. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, we we took into consideration yeah. health and safety every single day. And then we just threw it out the window. And then we just threw it out. No, I'm just kidding. No, yeah, every single day we we you know we were you know just making sure that I was yeah. you know getting I was clean and I wasn't getting skin breakdown or those kind of things. When you're sitting in a wheelchair all day long, those things you're prone to those things. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. we didn't have any issues. Right. And the last, last question. question. Here we go. So this is all for you, Jay. Could you tell us more about MAMA, or Multifocal Acquired Motor Axonopathy? That's a lot of syllables. It is. It's, it took me a while to even get it. Um, I don't know how much more I can tell you, you know, from what you learned in the film, but the disease that I have is very rare. Not a whole lot of people have it in the United States. Uh, and it's very, very similar to ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, just a lot longer of a, um, I guess, prognosis or the way that timeline, kind of yeah. timeline. Um, none of us on this planet know how much time we have on this, on this earth. Um, but you know, it's just, uh, my autoimmune system attacks my nervous system and then my nervous system, my motor nerves shut down. So I just, I can feel everything from head to toe. It just doesn't. My muscles don't work the way that they should, and there's something going on, and they don't know why, and there's really no cure for it. So, you know, it's forced me, or in many ways, to really look at life through a different lens, to rely on others to help carry me through from a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, Patrick is so awesome to step into that journey with me, and Ben has been along my side, uh, along with my wife and my kids and my family and our small group that we're part of. I mean, we have, I have, I've been very blessed to have um, people in my life that love and support me and will be willing to help do what they can. Um, but the disease, uh, until there's a cure, there's really nothing I can do about it except for just kind of do the best that I can and navigate the challenges that come with it. Yeah. And so it's not a fun disease, um, but you know, Every day you gotta kind of get up, you gotta start the day, and, and I just focus on things that I'm grateful for in life, and that's basically all I can do, and just do the best that I can, and yeah. have fun, yep. and live life the best that I can, and yeah. So that's, that's it, it, guys. That's that the is it. end of our Q&A. So glad that we gotta you know, be a part of this in some way, shape, or form. So Cotting School, thank you for viewing the uh, film. Hope you enjoyed it. And thanks for listening to us ramble on about all these questions you guys sent our yes. way. Yes, and I must apologize oh. <laughs> that you had to see my butt crack at least three or four times in the film. <laughs> it ain't pretty. It's a beautiful butt crack. But you know what? <laughs> I apologize. Thanks, yeah. guys. On the for... big screen. <laughs> on the big screen. Yeah. Thanks, right. guys, for, thanks so much. for watching the film. Hope you enjoyed it. And thanks for hearing us ramble on for a while. All, all right. right. Have a great one. Bye.